Our class on Reformation to today, it is Church History 2. If you're interested in from the Apostolic Age to pre-Reformation, you can go online to litchapala.org. Thanks to my lovely wife Carolyn putting all these videos up. <laughs> you can go in and watch all of the lectures from last term if you want to get the first part of the church history up into pre-Reformation. Um, this is our schedule for our current class in Reformation. Last week we talked about some of the forces leading to Reformation. I'm going to spend just a few minutes kind of encapsulating that today and giving you a couple of other uh, data points, if you will, talking about what was it that caused the Protestant Reformation or laid the foundation for or led up to the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s. And then we're going to spend most of our time today talking about Martin Luther and the Lutheran Reformation. Luther was not the only or even the first of the people who advocated Reformation, but I would maintain by, by clear acts of the Holy Spirit, there are particular historical events and forces that coalesced in order to make it possible for Luther, a German monk, to be the one who really uh, most significantly was responsible for the, the Reformation being the force that it became in the 16th century, beginning in 1517. Um, and then moving forward for Protestantism to exist, all right? Uh, before I get into particular lectures, I will give you a little visual here. So the guy on the left is Martin Luther. Um, he, uh, he looked very much like the woman he married later, uh, Catherine von Bora. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you the story about his, his wife, who was a nun, um, who, speaking of springing people from something, Luther arranged for a group of nuns to escape uh, the nunnery where they were, and once he did so, because it was still illegal for nuns to leave monast the monastic order, when he arranged for 19 uh, nuns to escape from uh, the convent, he then had responsibility, since he got them out, to figure out what to do with them, either to find them positions where they could, uh, you know, take care of themselves, or husbands. Well, there were a couple of them that, you know, they couldn't find jobs for, they couldn't find husbands, and one of them, Catherine von Bora, I said I was going to talk about this in a minute. But she, she said that she wasn't interested in all the, all the men that they were proposing. There were only two men she would marry, and one of them was Dr. Luther. So, <laughs> Luther and Catherine and Laura ended up marrying one another, um, and they had a very, a very interesting, but very, apparently very happy family life, and um, they had a great fun with each other. You know, she was always accusing him of being a slob, and he referred to her as my Lord Catherine. <laughs> so... Uh, very interesting. Anyway, and this picture on the right, which is kind of dark, I apologize for that. That is the uh, door of what's that? This is this is the door of the uh, Castle Church in Wittenberg, uh, All Saints Church, which is that's not the original door. You can't see this. The original door was where Luther nailed the 95 theses or the 95 proposals that ended up being the start of the Reformation to a great extent. <clears throat> Um, and now, these are different doors because these actually have the 95 theses engraved on them. Um, and so, uh, if, you, if you look at that picture up close, you can see that there's writing on there. Anyway, just a, a couple of visuals. I, I wanna, I'm going to go ahead and put all this up here because I'm going to be talking about uh, the pre-Reformation, you know, leading up to Luther a little bit, and then we'll get to this, but, and you can, you can refer to these things if you talk about it. Let me talk a little bit about the, as the 15th century, that is the 1400s, remember, the you know, 15th century, 1400s, it doesn't line up you know, exactly. I, I hear people make that mistake all the time. They'll mean the 1500s and they'll say the 15th century. That's, so when the fifth, as the 15th century was coming to a close, we talked last week quite a bit about the fact that the church was in desperate need of reformation. And many, many people longed for reformation. They advocated for it. And there were several reasons for that. It was a <laughs> decline in trust and popularity in the papacy because of simply the corruption that the popes had shown. They came through the period of the Avignon um, papacy where we, uh, the, the popes, seven French popes in a row, ended up refusing to move to Rome and living in France and becoming sort of the, the puppets of the French king. Then we had the Great Schism where you end up with two or even three popes which finally got resolved, and, and everybody looked at that and said, these guys are more interested in having, having power, political power, than they are in you know, advocating the kingdom of God. And so 
Um, that was called the Great Schism, when you, we had multiple popes. They had two, and then a council of the church was called, and they said, okay, you two are no longer popes, here's a third pope. But then the first two didn't step down, so you ended up with three. And then later on, the consular movement, as it was called, meaning the church councils, were supposed to take responsibility from then on to make sure everything stayed right. But then we had a split in the councils, so you ended up with two church councils and two more popes again. And it just got messy. The point was that the, the popes were recognized through the late 13th and 14th centuries, or I'm sorry, late 14th and 15th centuries, as being responsible for war, for political intrigue, bribery, licentiousness. We had popes who had multiple illegitimate children who they would name cardinals, and they, and they didn't hide it. I mean, they were very open about it. There was a period called the period of the pornocracy in Rome, where one of the popes turned the, the, the cathedral of St. John the Lateran, which is the, technically, that's the, the bishop's seat of the pope, because the, bishop is the, the pope is the bishop of Rome. He turned it into a brothel, literally a brothel. And just a horrible time. And so people had, on the one hand, people wanted the affirmation to believe in, as they had in previous uh, centuries, in the church, and the church is represented by the bishop of Rome, the pope, but they simply couldn't anymore. They had lost faith in what the church had become and represented. Uh, the consular movement, which was supposed to resolve this, the councils, they ended up creating additional problems. And so the consular movement lost its authority, and the popes took over again. You continue to have problems, moral problems, like absenteeism, which meant a bishop would be named over an area. He got all the income from that bishopric and never went there. There were cases where people were bishops of an area for 30 years and never went to the area they were bishop over. That's called absenteeism. Uh, pluralism, where somebody would be a bishop over multiple areas because a bishop made a lot of money. And it was purely a financial thing for them. And things like simony, where they would purchase a church position in order to have a income from it. All of this stuff was going on. It made it almost impossible for any, um, any priest or any monk, or any bishop even, who wanted to be honest, who wanted to be godly, who wanted to pursue uh, a legitimate service to the Lord, they were in a system that almost prevented anybody from being righteous. I mean, they couldn't do anything without paying somebody a bribe, and that was within the church. So for all of that, um, we ended up, after the consular movement uh, ended, the, for instance, the Fifth Lateran Council, which started in 1512, Pope Julius II, the whole focus of that council was to try to figure out how the Pope could regain political power, how the Pope could become a major political force again. And that, interestingly enough, that Fifth Letter in Council, which lasted from 1512 to 1517, it, it dissolved in March of 1517, was just a few months before the, tech, the official start of the Protestant Reformation. So you had all of this mess going on. At the same time, you had uh, the the move of nationalism was going on. Uh, France and Spain had been strong countries for a long time and had strong kings. But Germany had been these various sort of fiefdoms, these, these principalities. Feudalism, this idea of local landlords having serfs that work for them, feudalism was going out. Nationalism, the idea of being a national entity in Germany and the Netherlands and some of the countries that had had a nationalist idea, that was coming into their own. Uh, so this, this movement toward nationalism was a factor that will feed into this. The fact that Luther was a German um, was significant because the German people were looking for heroes in order to sort of rally around as a nation, because Germany had not been one nation before that. You, a couple of very strange things happened. Constantinople um, being attacked by the Turks, a lot of scholars and scholarship had come west and was now available in Western Europe that had come from Greek-speaking Constantinople. Well, with them, they brought a lot of scholarship, including uh, some of the oldest documents that the church had. Well, the scholars in the West started comparing what they had in Rome, for instance, with what came from Constantinople, which was older and closer to the original New Testament church, and they saw that a lot of changes had taken place in terms of how they were doing church. And so there began to be a movement to go back to what these new documents and new scholarship from, from the East had told them the New Testament church was really like. So there was all of that. There was a move toward uh, studying Greek again instead of Latin. And when they studied Greek, they had access to the more original documents of the New Testament, which were written in Greek. They no longer had to just look at the Latin Vulgate, somebody else's interpretation of it. They could go back more to the original documents. So all of this meant there was this 
the dissatisfaction with the church as the way it was, and other forces that were leading them to say, we need to reform this. We need to go back to more of the way the New Testament church was, and uh, more of a sense of what God wants the church to be. Now, we also had huge problems with discontent in the masses. The poor were getting more and more and more oppressed. They were taxed by the wealthy. They were taxed by the church. There were uh, re revolts, um, uprisings by the peasants. There were revolts by the knights. I said the feudal system was going away. Well, the knights and the landlords were losing their power. They rebelled. All of this stuff. I mean, at the start of the 15th century, but, you know, everything seems like it's in turmoil, and nobody really is in charge anymore. And so we've got all of this fomenting of problems. Um, at the same time, the Inquisition in Spain and Portugal, but especially in Spain, had initially started out in order to try to identify heresies. Well, um, the Pope, when the Pope got so busy with other things, he turned the responsibility for the Spanish Inquisition entirely over to Ferdinand and Isabel. Recognize those names, Ferdinand and Isabel? They're the ones that sent Columbus to the New World. Well, actually, the, uh, Ferdinand and Isabel took responsibility for the Inquisition in Spain. They had grand inquisitors, particularly Tomas de Torquemada, and they it started out trying to find heresy, and they very quickly turned around and they started persecuting Jews who had converted to Christi Christians. Spain, at one point earlier than that, had forced Jewish people to become Christians. Then the Inquisition comes along and says, we don't believe they're really Christians, and so we're going to torture them and to find out if they really mean it or not. Okay? That's a little, you know, I, that's a little exaggeration, but not much. Um, and in 1492, important date, you know, discovery of America, uh, we say discovery, excuse me, but there were people here. They, they, they already knew there was a new world, you know, it's Columbus about it, but in 1492, all of the Jews in Spain were forced to be baptized if they hadn't been already or leave the territories. They ended up ex exiling, driving out of Spain 200,000 Jews, and many of those Jews were killed. Uh, they fell victim to pirates, um, all sorts of things. I mean, it wasn't just like, that, oh, well, they had to move. Many, many thousands of them were killed. They lost all of their possessions because they weren't allowed to take anything with them. It was a really horrible time. Well, after the Jews were gone, uh, in Spain, the fall of Grenada, uh, in the, uh, the Castilian uh, Grenada, was the last Muslim stronghold in Spain. You remember, the Muslims had conquered all of North Africa and had moved up across the Straits of Gibraltar into Spain and Portugal. At one time, they'd gotten all the way up into France. Well, they started driving them back. During this same period of time, in the late, uh, the, the late, 14th, late 15th century, they... Uh, finally drove all the Muslims out, but when the Muslims finally agreed to leave, there was a, an agreement, and they said that any Muslims that stayed behind, and they were educated people, they contributed to the economy, they sort of wanted them to stay, the terms of surrender said um, that if you surrender, then you can keep your religion, you can keep practicing Islam. But after they had dealt with the Jews and driven off 200,000 Jews from Spain, they turned against the Muslims and said, no matter what we told you before, you have to be baptized as a Christian. You cannot no longer practice your religion. And it ended up being a rebellion and a war, another war over this. And it's like the church went from one thing to another thing to another thing that involved war and violence and, you know, uh, greed and all kinds of stuff. And so all of Western Europe was in a position at the start of the 1500s where everyone had a sense it can't keep going like this. It's also a time when the printing press comes along. Um, and it, it, I can, I can, we could can, we can have a list of like 150 different things that happened at the end of the 1400s, start of the 1500s, that either caused a negative impression toward the way things were being done, or, or caused people to have a sense of something positive that could happen. The printing press being one where it's promotional, people could begin for the first time to start talking about ideas and spreading those ideas in a reasonable way so that there was a, a greater focus on the potential of where they could go from there. Okay. That brings us down to the idea at this point that um, we, many people in the 1300s and 1400s had experienced reformers already. Last week we talked about, for instance, John Wycliffe, who was in England. 
His writings got reproduced and sent all over. The movement, the law words came from him. He basically said, Scripture is the authority. We have to focus on Scripture. Any pope that does not follow what Scripture says shouldn't be listened to. Okay. Wycliffe's ideas got transferred to the continent and eventually to Bohemia, what we know as Czechoslovakia, and John Huss picked them up and started teaching these. He was a professor at the University of Prague. And as he was teaching it, people began to listen to this, and so it's spreading all over Europe, this idea. Well, Wycliffe, was, was, uh, he died. He died and was buried in church property, but after he died, they declared that he'd been a heretic, so they dug him up, burned his bones, and dumped him in the river. And like I said last week, it's almost like, well, we'll show you. you know? <laughs> um, and then John Huss was promised by Emperor Sigismund that he, he would come to the Council of Constance, the one of the councils that was trying to sort out this multiple pope problem, the Great Schism, if you would come to Council of Constance, I promise you free uh, and protected travel there and back, and you can you can tell us what your ideas are. Well, he got there, and Sigismund, by the time John Huss got to, the, to um, Constance, to the Council of Constance, Sigismund had decided that Huss was not a horse that he wanted to back, and so they arrested him. They ordered him to recant, even though they wouldn't tell him what it was he's supposed to have said that was wrong. They ended up burning him at the stake, okay? he and one of his followers. So that didn't go over very well. Okay? Um, then we run into this character, Martin Luther. Martin Luther uh, lived from 1483 until, he lived until he was 62 years old, until 1546. He was, as I said, German. And that was one of those, those astonishing sort of historical phenomena, the fact that Germany was the one place, if he'd been in France or he'd been in Spain, both of which had very strong central governments, strong kings, they probably would have suppressed him right away. The fact that he was in Germany, which was, did not have a strong sense of being a nation, they were different principalities, uh, and yet they wanted to have a national identity, it meant that he had people who wanted to support him because he became the national hero for a lot of them. And so um, he was a monk, a priest, a professor of theology, and a key leader in the Reformation. Let's talk some about Luther. Now, um, Carol and I were talking about this on the car on the way over. We had a good friend who grew up Catholic, and then she started attending the Presbyterian Church. She said to us one day, I think it was on Reformation Sunday, and uh, our, our minister, Earl Palmer, had preached upon uh, on, you know, the Reformation, and he mentioned Martin Luther, and afterwards our friend Jean Marie said, you know, I grew up Catholic, Martin Luther was always the worst guy possible. <laughs> and now you guys talk about him as a hero. Okay? Well, the same thing is true right now. If you go online and you go to the Catholic Encyclopedia and look up Martin Luther, it will say, the man responsible for the rebellion of the 16th century, not the Reformation, the rebellion. Okay? Um, Luther, to many uh, Catholics then and today, was an ogre who tried to destroy the church. He uh, was actually called by Pope Leo at the time uh, Luther was alive and working. Um, the papal bull, which came out against Luther, called him a wild boar that had trampled the Lord's vineyard. He was called by a renegade monk by the emperor at that time, Emperor Charles V, who had been Spanish, the Spanish king. Um, he was claimed to be they claimed he was responsible for shattering monasticism, even though monasticism at that point, convents and monasteries had become centers for leisurely living. They were known for having wonderful parties. You know, you'd go there, you'd go to the monasteries for uh, the an, an evening of drinks and conversation. All right, there was no discipline, there was no educational focus. The monastic world had become, you know, ridiculously uh, corrupt, and there were no no requirements. Um, and, and they made a good living, all right? They were well paid for being monks and nuns and those things. So, on the one hand, you have all of these people that think that Martin Luther was the worst guy ever. On the other hand, there are, in his day and today, people who see Luther as being truly one of the greatest heroes of the Christian faith, that he was the one that restored a focus on the pure gospel, uh, a champion of biblical truth, a focus on the truth of scripture as our priority, and the one who, more than anybody else, was focused on reforming a corrupt and even apostate church. So it all depends on who you ask. Modern times, very few, even Catholic scholars, will question Luther's sincerity. And in fact, many Catholic scholars will today will say that while they may not agree with what happened in terms of the, the church splitting in two, Catholicism and Protestantism, even Catholic historians will agree today, many of them, that the protest that Luther was making about the problems in the church were legitimate, and that something had to be done. 
They may not agree with what happened, but they don't disagree with the fact that Luther was right, that there were things that were wrong with the church at that time. Okay? Um, he's recognized as being a very, a very conflicted kind of character, our Luther. On the one hand, he was very erudite and studious. He, he read and spoke several languages. He is, his translation of the New Testament into German, which he did when he was in hiding from the emperor in Wartburg, I'll get to that in a minute, but his, his German translation of the, the New Testament, and then, which took two years, and then ten years to translate the Old Testament into German, he really rewrote the German language. Um, his, his expertise in language was extraordinary. When he wrote the New Testament in German, it affected the way people spoke German overall. And so the modern German language is said to begin with Luther's New Testament. Okay? Um, and yet, while he was erudite, scholarly, a linguist, he also was rude and uncouth. He tended to say coarse things. Uh, people had trouble getting along with him, especially late in his life. He, he became a crotchety old goat in late in life, and people really had problems with it. Late in life, he became quite anti-Semitic, um, very much against the Jewish people. And so, you know, like every one of us, he was a com very complex individual. Historical characters, we always want to paint them with one color. And yet, Luther is a perfect example of somebody who was, you know, he was the best of all people and the worst of all people in some ways. And yet, he was the one that God chose to use in this very important way. No one ever doubts uh, has doubted the sincerity of his faith or the passion that he had for the gospel of Christ, even though he could be very vulgar in expressing his own passion about things. You know? uh, so, the, let's talk a little bit more about how Luther came to be. Um, born, he was born in uh, Eisleben in Germany in 1483, and his parents were of modest means. His father had been a miner who later owned some foundries, um, and they were very rough on Luther. Luther, throughout his adult life, would say that he was very harshly treated by his parents. They would beat him for virtually no reason until he bled. Um, and so he held, he held that against them for, for, for most of his life, that his parents, he did not feel had been fair to him. And it was a deep imprint on his character. Later on, when he um, went, started school, he had teachers who, if he didn't have his lessons down enough, would beat him for it. And so he had... You know, sort of these, his character was partly formed by the fact that he had had a very disciplined, not just disciplined, but a harsh yeah. upbringing, okay? And that affected how he thought about things. It meant that when Luther locked onto something, he was a pit bull. He did not turn it loose. And it didn't matter if it was the emperor or the bishop or, or the pope or anybody else telling him, you know, you're wrong, you can't do that. Part of his upbringing meant that when he latched onto something and believed that it was true, he wasn't going to let anybody you know, talk him out of it, no matter what the consequences were. And that was necessary, given what he faced later in life. Um, in, as we got up here, in 1501, he entered the University of Erfurt. His father, who had, who had worked very hard to try to give him an education, was insistent that he become a lawyer. As a lawyer, make good money, it was a reputable thing. But he goes to Erf the University of Erfurt, and his response to it was, it was, you know, it was a, a uh, pub and a, and a brothel. You know, every, drinking and womanizing was the only thing anybody wanted to do. He was a very serious young man, and very quickly he began to focus, instead of law, he began to orient himself toward theology and philosophy, and ended up studying those, and, and um, sort of informally at first. Then in 1505, he had an experience when he was 22 years old. He was traveling and got caught in a terrible lightning storm, and was almost struck by lightning. He was scared to death. And so in the midst of that, he made a promise to St. Anne that if he would be allowed to live through that storm, he would become a monk. Well, he lived through the storm, and he announced to his father he was becoming a monk. He was joining an Augustinian priory near their hometown. His father went ballistic, did not forgive him for years and years and years after that. Uh, but Luther kept his promise. He became a monk, he entered the Augustinian monastery. He was very serious about his spiritual life. In fact, so much so that he became almost a problem to his confessor, you know, the, the priest who was his confessor, who was also the head of the monastery. They recognized that Luther was brilliant. Um, they got him involved in academic studies very early on, but he had a constant concern for his salvation. He talks a lot later in life about how at that point he was so aware of his own sin and 
consistent with Catholic belief, thought if he didn't confess a sin, then any sin, even the slightest one, even one he just forgot, would be sufficient to send him to hell. And so he, was, he would keep lists of all of his sins and really search himself and say, what bad thoughts have I had? You know, what evil intent have I had? And he would confess those, and it said that sometimes as he was leaving the confessional, something else would occur to him, and he'd want to turn around and go back in and confess that too. He had a constant fear of God because of that, that God was the judgmental God who was going to send him to hell, and, he's, and he was like the monk of all monks. He did everything that was expected and beyond, but his confessor and superior in the monastery couldn't seem to shake him loose from this, from this fear. And in fact, he confessed later that while they said, well, you just have to love God, his, his uh, superior told him to study the mystical writings, which focused on experiencing the love of God and focusing on the love of God, which influenced later Protestant pietism. Luther studied this stuff and it talked about, well, you have to focus on your love for God. And Luther later confessed that I realized because I was so afraid of God, I didn't love him. I hated him. I was afraid of him. I couldn't love him. Well, his superior said, well, I think the thing you need to do to deal with all of these concerns and problems you have, Luther, is become a pastor. Okay? And, and toward that process, they wanted him to study the Bible to prepare himself for a priesthood. Now, there's a difference in a monk and a priest. A lot of Protestants don't understand that. Monks are not ordained in the same way. They don't offer communion. They're not pastors. You have to be a priest for that. And so he became not only a monk, but a priest. He studied biblical uh, theology. There's, a, there's a, a mistake, an error that some Protestants made that Luther claimed never to have seen the Bible or known anything about the Bible until the time of his actual serious conversion. That's not true. He had two degrees in biblical studies before any of the sort of major conversion things happened. Um, in 1508 and 1509, he received two different bachelor degrees in biblical studies, all as part of him doing what he was ordered to do by his superior, and that is to prepare himself to be a pastor, to pastor, take care of, teach the Bible. He then got his Doctor of Theology in 1512, and at that point was invited and then told, you know, he was still a monk as well as a priest, he was told he should accept an offer to become part of the, the Faculty of Theology and Philosophy at the University of Wittenberg. This is in Germany, what we know of, what we've historically known as Eastern Germany. But uh, the University of Wittenberg was founded by Frederick of Saxony, one of the princes, he was known as Frederick the Wise, and he becomes a very important character in um, Luther's history. Well, Luther goes along, and he, um, when he first became a monk, he had felt good about God, and then he became more and more aware of his own sin. He was more troubled by this. He suffered from depression. He obeys orders, studies, gets two bachelor's degrees and a PhD, or a doctor of, of uh, theology, and then he um, starts to teach. At first, he teaches the Psalms, which he knew by heart, because the, as a monk, they had they had sung the Psalter every day, several times a day. He knew it by heart. He taught classes on the Psalms. He was still having trouble. When he finished the Psalms, he started teaching the class on Romans. That's where things changed for Luther. As he began to study Romans very intently, um, he got into the first chapter of Romans. This is in 1515. And in the first chapter of Romans, as he studied it, he read in that first chapter something that became the solution to his fear and to his frustration. He discovered in Romans 1.17 a passage which says that the righteousness of God is revealed to his people. Well, Luther had grown up and consistent with the whole doctrine of, of penance in the Catholic Church, had grown up believing that righteousness was something you accomplished by living the righteous life, confessing your sin, being the best person you can, and that would make you righteous. When he reads in Romans 1, the righteousness of God is revealed, he realizes that's not the way I've been thinking about it. I thought righteousness was something you achieved, not that was given to you or revealed to you. And so he began this quest to try to figure out what that meant. And he realized that the justice of God, the righteousness of God, is linked to God's mercy. And that righteousness is not something you achieve, but rather righteousness is something that is a gift of God to you. Later on, he would begin to focus on the book of Galatians and Ephesians. Ephesians, for instance, says, 
you know, um, it is by grace you are saved through faith. It is the free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, all of those other verses began to make sense to Paul, to, uh, Paul, to Luther later, but the one that kicked it off for him is the realization that righteousness is from God to us, not something we achieve. That justification by the righteousness of God and not by works became the plank on which Luther's theology and the Protestant Reformation got built. And it was because of that preparation for teaching in the, the book of Romans. So, Luther later on said about that experience in Romans, uh, and I quote here, I felt as if I had been born anew and that the gates of heaven had been opened. The whole of Scripture gained a new meaning. And from that point on, the phrase, the justice of God, which is what he'd been afraid of, that God was going to nuke him because he was bad. From that point on, the phrase, the justice of God, no longer filled me with hatred, but rather became unspeakably sweet by virtue of a great love. That God had given righteousness, not demanded it because of our actions. Everything changed at that point. And in effect, at that point, Luther was able to say that whereas earlier he had feared that he might go to hell, that God would damn him to hell, once he realized that righteousness was from God, he was able to turn to God and say, Lord, God, you are the righteous God, and if you decide that you're going to send me to hell, then that must be the right thing, and I will accept that. And he said from that moment on, he never again feared for his salvation. It's a huge difference. Uh, Dorothy Sayer, you know, many, many years later, Dorothy Sayer said that there is a huge chasm that splits Christianity. And that chasm is not between Protestants and Catholics. That chasm is between those people who in their heart of hearts believe that salvation is of grace and those that believe that salvation is of works, <clears throat> that you have to do something to earn it. Well, that's the chasm that Luther crossed from believing that his salvation was based upon what he did, his works, to the realization that it is entirely a free gift of God. And nothing he could do could affect it one way or the other. He could only accept it and receive it. Okay? So... Luther has developed this new understanding of Scripture. He begins to share it with his colleagues on the faculty at the University of Wittenberg. They begin to believe it. They begin to buy into this. And so the whole theology and philosophy faculty at Wittenberg began to be Lutherans, even though nobody was called a Lutheran at that point. Uh, they began to accept that his view of where righteousness comes from as a free gift of God is what Scripture says. And so they begin to buy into this. At this point... Nobody is beginning to think of this as being in any way counter to what the Catholic Church is saying, even though it's true that what had caused the problem, emotional, psychological, spiritual, for Luther prior to that, had been because he was technically following the teachings of the Catholic Church. And he has made a major change in that. Okay? Now, he continues teaching, he continues his pastoral duties, he continues to share this idea with people, and everything seems to be going along pretty well, until we get to a time in history where, um, well, I should say, at that point, we know about the 95 Theses that he nailed to the door in 1517, but actually, because of his study of Scripture and these new ideas, Luther first came up with a set of 97 Theses that he wrote, which he intended to be for debate. And he thought, okay, this may create a little bit of a furor, because he knew he was, he was presenting some theological ideas that were not common. Well... In the university, they debated them, but nobody really cared. It wasn't a big deal on these 97 theses. Then, uh, we come to a time in history. At that point, the Pope is Pope Leo X. Leo X was of the family of the Medicis. You know about Lorenzo the Great and all the Medicis. Pope Leo X was one of the worst popes ever. He was one of the ones that had all kinds of illegitimate children that he openly acknowledged. He had mistresses. He took his illegit uh, illegitimate children and made them dukes and counts and cardinals in the church. Um, and Leo was, he, he's one of what they call the Renaissance popes, which means he was more interested in, in the art artistry and whatnot of the Renaissance and of regaining frequently the glory of ancient Rome in terms of statues and sculptures and great buildings than he was the gospel. And it wasn't just him, but he was probably the worst of them. Leo X was one of the worst popes ever. Well, one of the things that Leo X wanted to do as sort of a declaration of his greatness and to regain the greatness of ancient Rome was he wanted to finish what had just barely been started, which was the Basilica of St. Peter. St. Peter's in Rome, right? That's where you go if you want to see the Pope. Well, it, it was, they had just begun it, it, they had a long way to go, but to do that he needed to raise money. 
At the same time that Leo X was trying to figure out how to raise money for the Basilica of St. Peter, he gets approached by Albert of Brandenburg, who was one of the German princes. He already had possession of two different Episcopal sees. Technically, he was already the bishop of two locations that he didn't go to. But what he really wanted, that the crown gem of all the Episcopal positions in Germany, was the Archbishop of Mainz. Albert of Brandenburg wanted to get a third Episcopal seat, the Archbishop of Mainz, because that's worth a lot of money. And so he went, he went to Pope Leo X and said, what do you want in order to give me that Archbishopric of Mainz? And Leo said, well, I'll tell you what, Albert, we'll strike a deal here. I need money. You want that, Bishop, uh, Bishop but it's going to cost you. They agreed that they would start selling indulgences in Germany, the area surrounding Wittenberg, Albert's area, and um, they would sell indulgences, half the money Albert got to keep, and then he would pay part of it back, and then half the money from the indulgences go to Rome. So Leo's got money to build the Basilica of St. Peter, right? Now, those of you who've been class last term know about what an indulgence is. An indulgence is a certificate that says you're forgiven of your sins. That the Pope in Rome says, uh, it's a get out of, get out of purgatory free card is what it is. <laughs> And they said that if you pay a certain amount of money, you get to get out of purgatory. Or you can pay money and get one of your relatives out of purgatory. So that they're, they're cleaned up from all of their sins and everything's good. Sometimes people would pay them, but you know, for sins they planned on committing. <laughs> um, John Huss, who was one of the great reformers who was burned at the, at the Council of Constance, earlier in his life had spent virtually every penny he had to buy an indulgence as a young man in his early 20s. And later on realized just what a stupid thing that had been. He almost bankrupted himself for something that wasn't valid. Well, Albert of Brandenburg, the prince who wanted to get this bishopric, and Leo X, the pope, set this thing up. And so they send a representative named John Tetzel, who was a Dominican monk, to this area of Germany. And he's got a bunch of pastors working for him. And they start selling these indulgences. Well, Tetzel was completely unscrupulous. I mean, he was, he was a terrible person. <laughs> He would say things, uh, he, it, but he was a good marketer. <laughs> Durable person, good marketer. Tetzel came up with all these, these slogans and sayings and sales pitches. For instance, he told people that if you buy one of the indulgences from him, that it will make you, as a sinner, cleaner than when you came out of your first baptism. <laughs> came out of baptism. That it will make you cleaner than Adam before the fall. Well, he said that... The cross of the seller of indulgences has as much power as the cross of Christ. In fact, he came up with the first jingle that we're aware of. I've told you guys this before. Uh, Tetzel said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from out of purgatory springs. <laughs> he was a horrible guy. And he was lying about this. In fact, all of the various scholars in, in Wittenberg, which was right in the middle where all this was taking place, all the theologians there are saying, this is not... Good theology. This is horrible. It's against Catholic theology. It's against biblical theology. There's no way that this is right. But this was under the auspices of the Pope and of the local prince, Albert of Brandenburg. So who do you complain to? Okay. Luther hears all this stuff, and he writes a letter first, and I've got it up here, uh, in 1517. Luther protests the sale of indulgences to his bishop, who happened to be the Bishop of Mainz, the position that... Albert was hoping to, to be over, the Archbishop of Mainz would be over the Bishop of Mainz. So he writes the Bishop of Mainz and complains about this. And they say, okay, monk, <laughs> mind your own business. The Pope and the Prince are both behind this, so you be quiet. So Luther, again, before he'd written 97 theses that had been talked about and debated in the university but didn't make a big deal, he didn't realize he was making a big deal this time. He wrote 95 theses most of them oriented toward why indulgences were a bad idea. And it included things like number 82, thesis number 82 was, if the Pope has the power to forgive sins and get people out of pur purgatory, why does he need to get paid for that? Shouldn't he, as an act of love and mercy and graciousness, just let everybody go rather than wait for, to get money for it? So you can understand how this might have been taken as kind of a poke in the face. No. Um, the difference between this one is he wrote this in Latin, just like he had the first set of theses that didn't make a big splash. 
But several people got a hold of this, and they decided that this is interesting, people should read this, so they translated it into German and had it printed up on the brand new printing presses that are now available and started distributing it. And all of a sudden, there's this huge tidal wave of furor over the whole idea of selling the indulgences. And Luther has lit a bonfire, and for that reason, October 31st, 1517, which is the date that he first nailed those 95 theses onto the door of the, of the All Saints Church in uh, Wittenberg, that's considered the day the, the Reformation formally started. So October 17, 1570. Because this got translated into German, got printed, got sent around, now Luther was still an honorable guy. He sent a copy of those 95 theses and a very respectful letter to Albert of Brandenburg, the local prince, and said, I want you to see this from my hand. Due respect, but I want you to see the questions I'm asking. And the theses were actually, they were in the form of a question. Why is it that? How can it be that? Scripture says, so how can you say that? Okay. Um, and so he sent it to Albert. Albert's response to this respectful letter and, and theses from, from Luther is to immediately contact Pope Leo and say, stop this guy. Well, Pope Leo, at the same time, he agrees that something needs to be done, but he talks to the emperor, who at that point was the emperor Maximilian, and says, we got something going on in Germany. What do you know about this? Well, the emperor Maximilian looks into this, and he's furious that a monk, I mean, he's also a priest, he's also a doctor of theology at Wittenberg University, but the Emperor Maximilian and Pope Leo X and Albert Brandenburg all agree that they are ticked off that this mere monk <coughs> is smarting off and questioning both the, the local prince and the Pope. And so they say, shut up. And Luther says, uh, why should I shut up? At this point, he's already got a lot of people who are supporting him, and he agrees all right, you want me to shut up? Let me explain in a little more detail, not just these questions, these theses. Let me explain where I'm coming from. And so he writes an extensive explanation, theologically and biblically, of where he's coming from on this stuff and why he is against indulgences. Well, in the process, he attacks them even more rigorously because now he's giving all sorts of explanations for why he believes this is ungodly. All right? <laughs> the Pope responds by telling the Augustinian order. Remember that, that, that uh, Luther is an Augustinian monk. The Pope contacts the Augustinian order and says, you better rein this guy in. So they end up having a meeting of the Augustinian order in Augsburg, I'm sorry, in Heidelberg, and they call Luther to this meeting. Well, Luther's afraid that he's going to be arrested as a heretic and burned at the stake, because that's what they did to people. Remember, they did it to John Huss. He shows up in Heidelberg for this gathering of the Augustinian order and is shocked to find out that most of the other monks agree with him. They think he's right, that this is a terrible thing. And some of the younger ones are not only sort of saying you're right, they're enthusiastic about this and say, what are we going to do to support him? What are we going to do to, to advocate on his behalf? Well, they, you know, they, Luther goes home feeling pretty good about all of that. Um, and a lot of the other Augustinians, there had been a long competition, a long rivalry between Augustinian and Dominicans. You'll remember, Luther is an Augustinian monk. John Tetzel, Dominican monk. <coughs> These two orders had, had never got along very well. And so a lot of other Augustinians, who maybe even didn't agree theologically with Luther, politically, because they want to, they want to stick it to the Dominicans, say, we've got to back our boy. He's one of us. We're going to support him in this whole argument. So they agreed to support him. The Pope is really mad now because even the, his own, one of the orders of monks are disagreeing with him. So the, the Pope decides he's going to take a different approach. He calls for an imperial diet. Okay, D-I-E-T, spelled the same way, does not have anything to do with food. A diet, was it, the imperial diet, was a gathering of princes. It was the, the gathering of all of the people who had political authority. Now remember, in these days, it was thought that everybody who had political authority from the emperor on down, the princes, everybody else, that their position, they owed it to the, you know, to God. That they were, in effect, had secular authority because God had allowed it. In fact, I told you Pope Leo X, one of the Medici family, was one of the worst popes ever. When he was elected pope, he, he openly said, 
God has given us the papacy, so let us enjoy it. So this idea that God was the one that put all these princes in place, the Pope calls together all of the princes and nobles in an imperial diet. They're to meet in Augsburg with Emperor Maximilian, and they send, the Pope sends his legate, or his representative, who is Cardinal Cajetan, a very erudite, very powerful man, and he's going there for two reasons. One, because the Pope wants him to convince all these German princes to support a, a campaign, a crusade against the Turks who are threatening Eastern Europe, and also to deal with this monk, this Luther, you know, put him in his place. Well, uh, Cardinal Cajetan um, sits down with Luther and says, recant. And Luther says, of what? And Cajetan says, don't argue with me, recant. <laughs> and Luther says, you're going to have to tell me what you want me to recant. And Cajetan says, don't smart off to me, boy, recant. <laughs> and Luther says, well, let's get together tomorrow, let me think about it. Well, that night, Luther leaves. Cajetan had been given uh, authority by the Pope to arrest Luther and bring him back to Rome for trial as a heretic. Well, Luther's not a dummy. That, he said, let me think about it overnight. <laughs> he leaves. He's gone. Um, again, remember, everybody, everybody has a clear recollection of what happened to John Huss. You know, they say, well, come in, free, free you know, yeah. protection. You just come in, we'll talk about this. He gets there, they arrest him and burn him. Okay. So Luther's not dumb. He leaves um, Augsburg. He, he goes away. Caetan has to go back to the Pope and say, I ah, slipped through my fingers. You know, I lost it. The Pope is mad again. <laughs> uh, at that point, you remember that the idea of German nationalism was huge. Luther, and one of the reasons that German nationalism was such a big idea to them is that their sense is, we are tired of these other... Uh, usually it was either the king of France or the king of Spain, up to that point, who had become the Roman emperor, holy Roman emperor, okay? It was, and he was supposed to be over all of Western Europe, all, all over Christendom. And they said, we're tired of these foreigners being named the holy Roman emperor and telling us what to do, and we're tired of these popes in Rome telling us what to do. We're Germans. And so Luther was, you know, he had, he had goaded the bear, you know, and so they're saying, hey, this guy's one of us. He's a German. We like him. He's not taking any, any bull off of anybody. <coughs> bull, bull, um, you know, not Pope, not, not Emperor, or anybody else. And so we like this guy. We want to support him. And he particularly found support from Frederick the Wise, who was the elector or the prince of Saxony, which is where Wittenberg was. Frederick the Wise had been the guy who had founded the University of Wittenberg. And so he also felt uh, an affinity for anybody who was on the faculty of his university. Now, Frederick the Wise is called that for a reason. He was a wise ruler. In fact, Frederick was less concerned about being politically appropriate for the emperor or the pope than he was being a just and wise ruler over his people. He took that responsibility very seriously. And he, his attitude, at first he wasn't sure he agreed with Luther. But his attitude is, nobody is going to do to my guy, because he's, you know, he's my university professor in my university from my place, a German. Nobody is going to take him off without a fair trial, without hearing him out, and burning him at the stake. I'm not going to let that happen. And so even though he wasn't sure he agreed, he was not going to let Luther be done away with without a fair trial. And so he ends up uh, protecting, protesting first, and protecting um, Luther. Now... At that point, Maximilian, the emperor, dies. And so they're getting ready to elect a new emperor. The two primary candidates for the new emperor of the Holy Roman Empire are Francis of France. A little confusing. Frank. Um, he, Francis of France or Charles I of Spain, the two most powerful emperors. Now, the Pope is not happy with either one of them. Because you'll remember, not too many years before this, they'd gone through the period of time of the Avignon Papacy, in which the Pope was a plaything of the French. And so ever since that time, there's been real tension between the French king and the Pope, because they don't want to get back in the place where the French are calling the shots. And the Pope, Leo X, is afraid that if Francis becomes the emperor, that he's going to start running the church again. On the other hand, Charles V, or Charles I of Spain is the most powerful ruler in all of Europe, he has more possessions than the New World. He, by uh, heredity, owns 
technically owns most of Western Europe, other than France. And the Pope is afraid if Charles I gets to be Holy Roman Emperor, that's going to be the icing on the cake, and I won't have any authority. Charles will take everything from me. You know, the Pope will have no power anymore. And again, remember, we've just gone through a couple of generations of the popes where their biggest priority was how do we get our secular power back. So neither Francis nor Charles I, neither the French or the Spanish king, are the guys that the pope wants in there. So the pope is looking around trying to find somebody else that he can support to become the emperor. Well, the next best candidate, as far as he can tell, is Frederick, Frederick the Wise of Saxony. Well, because for political reasons, Leo wants to try to advocate that Frederick the Wise of Saxony becomes the next Holy Roman Emperor, he's not going to confront Frederick and say, stop protecting Luther. And so, the Pope refuses to do anything about it. And there's, no, there's not an emperor in place right now to do anything about it. And so, nobody does anything about it. Luther, who is just... Again, he's bearded the, you know, the, the Pope and the, the Emperor. The Emperor's dead. The Pope is sort of uh, impotent at this point because he can't confront Frederick the Wise of Saxony, who's protecting Luther. This is, this is just an example. Over and over and over again during this time, various things happened that prevented anybody from really stepping on Luther at the point early on when they might have been able to actually stop this thing. Okay, so... Um, Luther continues to talk, he continues to write. Um, Frederick of Saxony is the Pope's candidate for becoming the new Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and we're going to take a break. I'm going to stop right there so that we can come back in a minute because I want to pick up on a number of things I want to stop. As I just mentioned, um, we now find ourselves after Luther leaves Augsburg, he leaves at night, uh, the Cardinal Cayetan is unable to arrest him, take him back to Rome. Uh, but at that point, all, again, all of these various kinds of political things are going on. Uh, Leo can't really take any action against him because he's being protected by the one person that Leo thinks might be a reasonable new emperor after Maximilian's death. And so the whole thing kind of goes on hold. Nothing happens. Well, in order to try to keep from offending um, Frederick the Wise of Saxony, Pope Leo sends a representative who is, whose name is Karl von Miltitz, who is actually a relative of Frederick of Saxony, to meet with Luther, to try to just basically get him to be quiet. Okay, just, we're not going to come after you, but, but settle down here. Well, Miltitz meets with Luther, and Luther agrees that if you guys won't come, keep coming after me, I will sort of keep quiet. And so they establish a truce. Milton's speaking for the Pope. And Luther says, that's all fine with me. But that truce gets broken because... Sneaking under the, under the camera there. <laughs> Waving your hands doesn't help. Yeah. You know. No one will ever see that. I realize that. At that, person, at that point, there's a professor whose name is John Eck. He's a professor at the University of in, uh, Ingolstadt. And he is a very rigid Catholic, and he is incensed by Luther's teaching. But the Pope has just agreed through his representative that they've got a truce, and nobody will attack Luther. Well, John Eck is determined to try to fight against Lutheranism. Yes, it's not called it yet. But he decides he can't go directly after Luther because the Pope has said he's off bounds. So instead, John Eck attacks the theology and the teaching of a man named Andreas Rudolf Bodenstein von Karlstadt. Von Karlstadt. These are, these are all Germans, okay? Most of them have nine names, yes? Is he German? Yeah. <laughs> now, von Karlstadt was a professor. He uh, was fairly impetuous. He was a little bold. He was, well, quite a bit bolder than even Luther had been in demanding that people accept these theologies. So, Eck challenges Karlstadt to a debate, a theological debate, in Leipzig. Well, the thing is that when they agree to a debate, and Eck issues the, here are the things we're going to argue about, he almost verbatim is quoting Luther. So he's really going after Luther's theology, which Karlstadt believes, and Karlstadt has been teaching, but it's very clear to everybody, he's really going after Luther, but he's doing it through Karlstadt because he's not allowed to go straight to Luther. Well, Luther considers that a violation of the truth and he's of the truce, and he says, "All right, if those are the terms you're going to debate, I'm I'm debating too." 
And so Karlstadt and Luther get together on one side, John Eck, a professor from Ingolstadt, on the other side, and it ends up being Luther and Eck going at each other. It, it, it's very clear, very quickly, that Luther is much more of a biblical scholar, but Eck has much more background in canon law, that is the law of the church, and in medieval theology, and so they're going back and forth. Finally, in the midst of this, of this conversation, Luther feels compelled to declare that he feels the Council of Constance had been in error when they condemned John Huss and executed him, and that the, um, a Christian, and this is something that Huss had said and Wycliffe had said, that a Christian who has the support of Scripture has more authority than the Pope or the councils or anything else. So a lay Christian with the truth of Scripture, Luther says, has more authority than the Pope and that the Council of Constance was wrong. Well, even though it may be that Luther won on some of the theological points, Eck really won because Luther openly, in front of audience, said, you don't have to listen to the Pope if he's not following Scripture, and the councils of the church can be wrong. That made him a heretic. Okay, so Eck feels like he has won that one. This starts a new stage in the whole Protestant Reformation because from this point on, there is much more aggressive confrontations, there is greater danger, there are people who are injured or even killed in confrontations between people who believe in Luther's doctrines and people who, who are following the Catholic doctrine. Um, throughout Germany especially, there are more and more people who see Luther as a German hero of the true faith against the church, the Catholic church, and particularly against Rome. In the city of Ingolstadt, again the University of Ingolstadt, which is where John Eck, the guy who debated Luther, came from, the faculty supported the arrest and exile of one of their own faculty members who had, who had agreed with some of Luther's theology. Interesting little side note here. At that point, a woman named Argula von Grumbach, who was a Bavarian noblewoman, writes a scathing letter to the faculty of the University of Ingolstadt uh, criticizing them on theological basis for their expulsion, for their supporting the arrest and exile of one of their faculty members who supported Luther. This letter is so popular, it goes through 20 different editions of printing and distribution in two months. Whoa. She kicks their theological butts, <laughs> so to speak. Well said. Uh, technical words. Uh, <laughs> she proves that she, a Bavarian woman, is more theologically adept on these issues than the theological faculty of the University of Ingolstadt. And again, she represents the kind of thing that was happening all over Germany at this point, where even lay people were being very vocal with their opinions, and many of them very learned lay people, as she was, God bless her heart. Um, now, at this point, German nationalists, people who supported the direction of the German, German nation that didn't exist at that point, as well as a lot of humanists, began again to see Luther as their spokesperson, as their mouthpiece for the creation of a German nation, and especially against the abuses they feel the German people have suffered at the hands of Rome and the Pope. And so he's a hero. At that time, Charles I of Spain does get elected as the new Holy Roman Emperor. He becomes Charles V at that point. And Char Frederick the Wise, being wise, had, instead of allowing himself to be presented by the Pope as a candidate, because he didn't want to side, take sides in this, he actually had supported the election of Charles. And so Charles V feels some obligation not to be too aggressive in opposing Frederick the Wise, because he knew Frederick could have been a competitor. Well, Frederick the Wise is still supporting Luther. So that means the new Holy Roman Emperor doesn't have quite as much freedom as he might have had otherwise to go after Luther. But Charles, who has been Spanish king, is now ruler of most of Europe. He is very conservative Catholic, and he feels like he has to do something to try to address this heresy that he sees in Luther. At the same time, the Pope no longer has any reason to hold back. All right, The guy he didn't want to become the Holy Roman Emperor is now the Holy Roman Emperor, so that's, that ship has sailed. It's time to do something else. The Pope at that point issues a bull, and again, a bull is a, is a formal statement of doctrine by the Pope. It's called a bull because the lead seal that was always attached to them was called a bulla. 
And so this is a formal declaration by the Pope. It was called Exurge Domine, in which Luther declared, I'm sorry, Leo, the Pope, declared that Luther was a wild boar who had entered the Lord's vineyard. He ordered that all of Martin Luther's books be burned, and he gave Luther, under threat of penalty of excommunication and declaration of anathema, 60 days to submit to the authority of the Pope. Well, it took a long time for that bull to catch up with Luther. Okay? It, 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 things didn't travel that quickly then. During the time in which the word had gotten out that the, it was coming, okay, but Luther didn't have it in his hand, during that time, there were a lot of conflicting reactions. In a few places, more conservative Catholics followed the Pope's directions and they started burning Luther's books. In other places, people who didn't like the Pope or the Catholic Church at this point and were German nationalists started burning his opponent's books, <laughs> John Eck, uh, John Eck and, and others. When the bull finally reached Luther after weeks, he burned it publicly. <laughs> Luther and a bunch of his followers publicly burned the official document that came to them from the Pope. And at that point, he also burned other books which he declared he was burning because they were proponents of Popish doctrines. That was it. The breach was final. The break was made. There was no way they were going back. Okay. Um, at that point, Luther responded to the German people um, in, in terms of calling for their support, asking them to continue to be uh, advocates for this new theology. They then called another diet. Remember, a diet is a gathering of the political officials with political and religious overtones. They called the diet of the German lords, and the new um, Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, was going to oversee this. They invited Luther to come. Interestingly enough, at this point, because Charles V was the, the new Roman emperor, but Francis of France was still very powerful, Charles and Francis uh, keep, ha keep going at each other, at war. In fact, Ignatius of Loyola, the guy that founded the Jesuits, one of the reasons he became wholly religious, uh, he had been a warrior, and he had been terribly wounded you know, in his leg at the Battle of Navarre. The Battle of Navarre was a battle between Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor's armies, and Francis of France. So they're going back and forth. Well, the interesting thing is that in an effort to try to get the Pope to support Charles and not support Francis, Charles keeps saying, well, you know, if you want me to do anything about this Luther, then you better back me against Francis. And so again, political things keep anybody from taking action too quickly. They then call, in 1521, the Diet of Worms. A friend of mine, when I took church history, would say, why would anybody want to go to Worms? <laughs> but the Diet of Worms, of all things, they call the Diet of Worms, the, uh, Charles V oversees this, they bring Luther in, and in the room where Luther is brought before the, the Emperor, Charles, there's a table covered with books, and they say that when the Emperor, and these are all books that Luther had written, dozens of them. The Emperor at first says, who are all the people that have written all these books? And they go, uh, one guy. This is him. This is Luther. Well, he comes in, and it's he has already defied the Pope. He comes in, the emperor says, you need to recant. And Luther says, what do you want me to recant of? And he said, of all of the writings in these books. And Luther said, well, now wait a minute. <laughs> some of the stuff in some of my books, nobody would disagree with. They're standard doctrine of the church. Luther confessed, and Luther's scared. I mean, this guy could order and kill right then. Uh, he had already defied the Pope, and now he's standing in front of the Holy Roman Emperor, who's telling him to recant. Luther says, some of this stuff nobody would disagree, but some of this I confess I was, I was pretty, pretty blunt in criticizing people, and maybe I was too blunt, maybe I was too harsh. So I apologize for maybe being too harsh sometimes against people. But some of what I deal with in my books have to do with tyranny and injustice against the German people by other rulers and by the church. Remember, the emperor is sitting in this room, but he's surrounded by other political leaders, many of whom are from Germany, German princes like Frederick the Wise and others. So, here Luther is seen as defending the German people against oppression. He continues, um, the emperor is not impressed, and he says, recant. Luther says, can I have a night to think about it? <laughs> 
And they say, okay, you get a night. <laughs> so they go away, the, they rest on it, they come back the next morning, and the emperor says to Luther, do you recant or do you not? Yes or no? Luther does not respond in Latin, which is what everything else had been. He responds in German. And he says, my conscience is a prisoner of God's word. I cannot and will not recant, for to disobey one's conscience is neither just nor safe. God help me. Amen. And then he does a fist pump. <laughs> the records say that he, he made a gesture of victory. And he turns and walks out. The emperor is furious. He will not have this monk defying him, the Holy Roman Emperor, who controls by heredity and by being the emperor, almost all of Europe. Luther has defied the Pope and the Church. He has defied the emperor and the empire. He walks out of the room. There was good reason for him to say, God help me. Yeah. 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 So, at that point, the emperor is preparing to declare him anathema, have him burned. They go looking for him. He's gone. Okay? Not dumb. Luther leaves. And as he leaves, Frederick the Wise of Saxony, and again, in this meeting, he had become even more of a hero to the Germans, including Frederick. Frederick, by this time, is not only agreed he has to support Luther because he's, he's his guy, he's from his area, he's a professor in his, in his school, but because he thinks he's right now. So Frederick orders a band of armed men to kidnap Luther as he's leaving. Mm -hmm. And Frederick says, I want you to hide him and don't tell me where. <laughs> so they kidnap Luther. Now, kidnap in a good way. They're, taking, they're protecting him. They take him to the castle at Wartburg. And nobody knows where he is. Nobody can find him. Charles issues orders to find this guy. Nobody can find him. And so Luther, who grows a beard, and presents himself, he uses a false name, he spends two years, almost, at Wartburg in hiding. Well, nobody can find him. Nobody can do anything about this. The whole time, the, the Lutheran doctrine is continuing to be spread and continuing to be believed by people. During that time, Luther spent his, his days translating the New Testament into German. And as I say, that not only was significant because it provided the New Testament in a language the German people could use, because most people didn't speak Greek, they didn't read Greek, they didn't read Latin. Um, and so that vernacular not only provided the Bible to them, it took him two years to translate the New Testament, ten years to finish the Old Testament, it really did remake the German language. Talk to any linguist, read any book about the German language, and they'll tell you that modern German language was invented by Martin Luther. So very significant. Um, while he was in exile, some of his collaborators at Wittenberg, where he had been a professor, including Karlstadt, the guy who had debated with him. Karlstadt, as I said, was impetuous. He tended to go too far. Karlstadt and Philip Melanchthon was a young Greek professor who was very mild-mannered. He was not the personality that Luther was, but he ended up being Luther's primary right-hand guy. It was Melanchthon who wrote the Augsburg Confession later, which is the primary confession of the Lutheran Church. Well, these guys continued to support Lutheran's doc Luther's doctrine even while he's in hiding. No one knew where he was. Um, some of them, like Karlstadt and others, began to be much more aggressive. They started making changes while they were gone. Um, they canceled, in, in Wittenberg, they canceled the days of fasting and abstinence that the church called for. The masses for the dead were abolished. Um, Melanchthon started offering communion in both kinds, which means that people, the lay people could receive both the bread and the wine. Previously, only the priests could drink the wine, you know, the, the cup. Uh, the pe lay people only got bread. They started offering the communion in both kinds. Um, the monastic communities, many of the monks and nuns left the monastic communities, and many of them married, which was against the law at that point. Um, worship was simplified and was offered in German, not in Latin. All of this stuff was happening while Luther was hiding at Wartburg. Um, in fact, it got to the point where it, got, it went too far. Luther fell. Karlstadt and some of his friends started going into churches and tearing down images of saints. So they started to get kind of violent about it. At the same time, 
they had figures showing up, like three laymen from the city of uh, Zwickau, which is nearby Wittenberg, uh, Wittenberg, Wittenberg, show up in Wittenberg and said they are prophets of God. God speaks to them directly, and so therefore they have no need of scripture. And so all of a sudden, it's like somebody took the barriers down and weirdness starts popping up. Okay? Some of it is is violent. Some of it is just stuff that Luther would not support. When all of this stuff is happening, Luther, who had sent word to his friends, not telling him where he was, but saying, I'm okay, don't worry about it. Luther realizes, because he's getting these reports at Wartburg, i got to do something. This is getting out of hand. And nobody else seems to be able to control it. He sends word to Frederick the Wise and says, I'm going back to Wittenberg. I don't expect you to protect me anymore. If God wants me to live, I will live. If God wants me to die, I will die. And so he was telling Frederick, I'm, I'm leaving your protection, but I'm not blaming you if something happens to me. Okay, so he leaves, he goes back to Wittenberg, and once again, um, we find our... He goes back and you're thinking, okay, they know where he is now, they're going to arrest him and attack him. But at that very moment... Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who for two, two years earlier had wanted to, you know, arrest and kill Luther, he's got a problem because Charles I of France, because they were at war with each other, he had arrested, they had captured Francis of France. Um, Charles, the Holy Roman Emperor, has him as a prisoner. After a while, he needs help because the Turks are attacking Vienna. <laughs> Suleiman the Great, the head of the Turkish <laughs> army, is attacking... Eastern Europe and threatened Vienna, and that would have opened up the whole um, eastern border of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles I has got to do something about that, and he says, I need as many army men as I can. So he releases Francis from his custody under truce and says, I'll let you go, you know, let's have peace, I need your support here. Francis goes back, Francis contacts the Pope, Francis and the Pope decide to go to war against Charles. No. <laughs> The point is, Charles is way too busy to worry about Luther right now. He's got Turks attacking Vienna. He's got Francis, who violated the truce that they had, and the Pope joining their armies together to attack, uh, to attack Charles, Charles V. Well, Charles has got the Holy Roman Empire. He takes his army and invades Rome, invades Italy, marches on Rome. The Pope has to leave Rome. They sack Rome, and this army is made up of Spanish, because Charles was from Spain, and German soldiers. Most of the German soldiers are Lutherans. <laughs> so when they attack Rome and drive the Pope out of Rome, they sack Rome, and the Lutherans do it because they feel like they're, they're, they've defeated the Antichrist. And they take it out on the city of Rome. So, everybody's too busy to worry about where Luther is and what he's doing right now, okay? <laughs> Leo X dies... Charles uses his influence to put in place his own confessor, uh, Adrian of Utrecht. He becomes Adrian the, the Sixth. He's the last non-Italian pope until the 20th century. It's 500, after Adrian, Adrian only lives about a year and a half. After Adrian, it's 500 years before they get a, almost 500 years, before they get a non-Italian pope. Okay? Big deal. And part of it is because, again, there were so many political things. Okay, we don't want a French pope because the French controlled the papacy for too long. We don't want a Spanish pope because Charles has become a real pain in the buns. You know, we don't. And so they say, let's keep it close to home. Let's, let's have Italian popes for all this time. Mm -hmm. um, during all of this, there are a number of uprisings. The knights, remember the feudal system is, is dying out. The knights rebel. Charles V has got to deal with the fact that he's got a rebellion of the knights. They put that down. Uh, several of the major leaders were killed. Um, they, so you've got a battle going on between the Holy Roman Emperor and his army and the knights, who were, uh, particularly the knights of Germany, but a lot of the knights. Then in 1524, there's a peasant rebellion, the other end of the spectrum. The peasants, who have been uh, badly treated all along, they rebel. In fact, to give you some idea how badly they've been treated, there were peasant rebellions in 1476, 1491, 1498, 1503, 1514, and 1524. And then again in 1525. Um, the peasants, particularly in Central Europe, Germany and the areas around that, have read Luther's writings. And they take that theology and attach it to their political and economic demands. They quote scripture and say, 
You have been unjust to us, and Scripture calls for justice. It calls for fair wages. The Bible talks about fair wages for the workmen. It talks about caring for those in need and in poor, caring for the widows and orphans. Well, the poor in their uprising, particularly in 1524 and 25, they take Luther's theology and quote it as being in support of their political uprising and rebellion. Now, Luther, at that point, again, all the big guys, the popes and the kings, are also busy fighting each other and fighting the Turks and everything else, that they're not bothering with Luther that much. Um, and so Luther announces to the knights and the princes that the claims being made by the poor people are legitimate. They really are oppressed, and you should be responsive to this. But when the peasants start attacking villages and burning villages and everything else, Luther, Luther is so much against acts of violence like that, he then supports the princes in their effort to suppress the peasant rebellion because he doesn't believe they have a right to kill people over it. Um, and this is one of the areas where, you know, where Luther's decisions may not always have been the best ones. But uh, when he supports the princes in their suppression of the peasants and the princes do defeat the peasants, then the peasants say, Luther has betrayed us. And some of them go back to the Catholic Church, some of them end up joining the Anabaptist movement, which starts up not too long after this. But the peasants are not that much in support of Lutheranism anymore. Okay? Um, and so these, these issues, rebellion, claiming that there, there are religious support for various rebellion in various directions, um, all of this, Luther is kind of caught in the middle. Luther is kind of at a loss. Luther at no time supported using his theological ideas and directions in support of any political agenda. Not the princes, not the, you know, not the emperor, not the kings, not the peasants. And in fact, Luther has a very clear theology. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it was my fault. Uh, try to escape key. See what happens. Um, Luther has a very clear theology of two kingdoms in which he talks about, and, and this is this, he sort of picks up from, from Augustine. Augustine had talked about the city of God and the, you know, the, the city of man, the idea of the heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom. Luther had a very similar kind of theology where he talked about you know, there is the, the, the kingdom of heaven or the, you know, the, the God's kingdom and there's the earthly kingdom. The God's kingdom represented by the church, if the church is doing it right. The earthly kingdom represented by the rulers, the political rulers, the, the princes and kings who, if they truly are obedient to the call of God, because Luther believed that that if a regent, uh, if a king or a ruler was a good guy, he was really trying to do the right thing, that they were God's regents on earth. And that God would use those regents to protect people from violence and from breaking of the law, that they would keep civil order, while the spiritual matters were supposed to be under the, under the church. Well, he saw these two kingdoms as being complementary. Everybody kept trying to intermingle them and say our political goals are supported by Luther's theology, or that... You know, the church's goals should be defended by the princes. And, you know, even that the Lutheran ideals should be fought for by the armies of Germany, or whatever it was. And Luther always opposed that. He was always having a problem with the fact that people wanted to put these two kingdoms, merge them, when he felt both were legitimate, but they, they were two different things. And he ran into lots of problems there. I mentioned to you that one of the other things that Luther did was to advocate that... Um, Monastic orders, while they were fine if somebody was called to that and wanted to be there, that if they felt called to leave that, then that was fine. Because Luther had a doctrine, which we, we Protestants still maintain today, sort of the priesthood of all believers. In other words, the doctrine of the Catholic Church had been that if you're called to monastic life, for instance, that was sort of a higher level of calling, and you were special. And that was a different divine calling. Luther said, every Christian has a divine calling. Every Christian should see themselves as a minister of the Lord. Every job that you do that contributes to human society can be a divinely anointed job if you're given the skills for it and you follow it correctly. So this idea of the priesthood of all believers was critical. That meant if somebody was a monk or a nun and felt that wasn't really their call, Luther said they had a right to leave. Law said they didn't. Okay, they were sort of in... in Servitude, sort of like a hospital in Guadalajara. Uh, they, 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 uh, oh, boy. Sorry. Um, and I mentioned the fact that, that along with that, Luther helped some of these monks and nuns to leave, and then he tried to help get them jobs, or in the cases of the nuns, get them married. That's how he ended up marrying Katerina von Bora, 
uh, which he referred to his his Lord Ka uh, Katharina, and she called him a slob. And, and Luther would, would write commentary about how weird it was. He'd been a monk his whole life to wake up and have pigtails on his pillow. Um, they had six children, apparently a very happy family life. In addition to their six children, they took in a number of orphans and other students. Luther always referred to that as his small church. And in fact, he created a homeschool kind of orientation to train not only his biological children, but these other children that he and Katharina took care of. And it became kind of a model for public education. They got picked up later because he was very disciplined, very serious about teaching his kids the basic stuff he needed to know. Now, um, and, and not only that, but Luther's own family life and the things he wrote about family and the, the model that he created for what a family should look like ended up being recognized as kind of a model for what the ideal German family was supposed to be. Uh, and so they had significant influence in that way as well. Um, one of the problems that you run into here is that because you had people committing violence, because you had people who were, there were rebellions that claimed theological justification from Luther or otherwise, even people who wanted to be moderates, like Erasmus was a very famous uh, thinker and humanist scholar at that point, uh, he's been called one of the great hearts of history. Um, he didn't want to pick sides. He didn't like discord. But when all of this violence started happening and the rebellions and everything, and they were claiming that they were using Luther's principles, even though Luther didn't support that, Erasmus <clears throat> felt like he had to pick them. And he picked for the Catholic Church and against Luther. And a lot of moderates, a lot of people who otherwise would not have allowed themselves to get pulled into that one way or the other, felt like when the violence started happening and things like that, that they had to choose one way or the other. And it ended up being a huge divide. It's important to note that Luther, it was not his intention to leave the Catholic Church. You know, Luther, until they excommunicated him and said, if we catch you, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna execute you. Until that point, until the Diet of Worms, when he finally left and ended up hiding out for, for the time in Wart Wartburg, um, Luther always hoped that the Catholic Church would wake up and realize that they needed to change and would accept that direction. He was not looking to start a new faith, a new church, a new religion. Um, and yet, it ended up everybody having to choose sides. There was no middle ground anymore after a while. Um, <clears throat> we then end up, Charles V, because of the problem in the East, uh, he leaves Western Europe and is in the East with an army fighting the Turks, trying to keep them out of Western Europe. Uh, he left right after the Diet of Worms. I mean, and, and that's another reason why they didn't do anything with Luther, not only because he was hiding, but because the guy who was really hot about this now is gone. Um, the edicts against Luther, with the emperor gone, because he's the one that really had, had uh, you know, Burr under saddle about this, nobody else was doing anything about it. Nobody else was picking this up and saying, okay, the Diet of Worms said that Luther was anathema and he's a heretic and we need to arrest him. People were just saying, shh, let's just not do that. Okay. It goes along for a while, and then another imperial diet in 1523 is held in Nuremberg. At Nuremberg, recognizing the need for some kind of unity in Germany, you'll notice all these towns are German towns, Leipzig, you know, Nuremberg, uh, Worms. At the Diet in, um, in Nuremberg, they declare that there is now a policy of tolerance. Now, the emperor is gone. He's not there. He's still in the, in the east. They declare a policy of tolerance toward Lutheranism, in spite of the fact that the pope and some of the, uh, and the, the legates of the emperor and the legates of the pope, their representatives who were there, complained about it. They didn't like it. The official declaration was, leave them alone. Even though they set aside the Edict of Worms, at the Imperial Diet of um, Nuremberg. So, that's in 1523. In 1526, there's still a struggle going on, uh, but the Emperor comes back. You have the Diet of Spire. Now, the Diet of Spire officially, now this is right before the Emperor comes back, actually. The Diet of Spire officially withdrew everything they had said at Worms. It said there no longer is an edict against Luther. That's fine, and then the emperor comes back the next year, they, or two years later, and they have the second Diet of Spire. The emperor is there. A number of other staunch Catholics show up, and they set aside the first Diet of Spire, <laughs> re-establish the declarations of the Diet of Worms, and all of a sudden, Luther's a bad guy again. 
Now, because there were a number of German princes and other uh, authorities who had been at the, the Diet of Nuremberg and the, and the first Diet of Spire, who had said, first, there's toleration, and then there's no, nothing against Lutheranism, they protested vehemently at the second Diet of Spire against the fact that they now reestablished or reinstated the Diet of Worms declarations. That's where we get Protestant. The German princes who had agreed for first toleration and then acceptance of Lutheranism as an option, when the emperor comes back in the second Diet of Spire, they, they set all that aside and say, no, Luther's a heretic, let's find him and kill him. Um, the princes who didn't agree with that, had agreed with the earlier ones, they protested. And they became known as the Protestants. Okay? They protested in favor of tolerance against Luther, or for Lutheranism, and so therefore became known as Protestants. This is at the Second Diet of Spire, 15, uh, 1529. Okay? We're off the charts. Um, that's where we get Protestant. In 1530, they have another diet of Augsburg, and Charles V is there. He refuses to listen to, uh, previously he had refused to listen to Luther's arguments. Now, because of the turn of events, because he now had princes who, who were protesting against his authority and protesting against everything, finally he says, okay, look, I will let this guy come and tell me what he's saying. I'll listen to him, let him explain himself, because he didn't do it last time. Last time he said, we can't. And he went, what do you want me to recant on? Don't argue with me, recant. That's what Cardinal Cahadon had said. That's what the emperor said. That's sort of what, that's what they did to John Huss, too. John Huss kept saying, please tell me what it is that I said wrong. And they felt like, no, we don't have to tell you that. Just recant. Whatever it was you said, recant. Well, finally, the, uh, the emperor says, I will listen to what this guy's saying. Well, Luther doesn't go, but Philip Melanchthon, who was Luther's right hand, he writes a document which includes all of the theological beliefs that Luther represents and had advocated. That is known as the Augsburg Confession. That is the primary confession, because it was written for the Diet of Augsburg, for Charles V, to understand what theologically they were saying, because he hadn't wanted to listen before. The Augsburg Confession, uh, 1530, is the primary confession of the Lutheran Church, and it is one of the confessions that we, Protest we Presbyterians maintain. The Augsburg Confession is part of our Book of Confessions, where we have all the great historical confessions, okay? Um, in fact, it was so significant, the Augsburg Confession, that later on, the, the Lutherans actually called themselves the Christians of the Augsburg Confession. So it was very significant to them. Uh, most of the Protestants, at first it was only written for the Protestants of Saxony, but they thought it was such a good, everybody thought it was such a good statement of what Lutheranism, what Protestantism, what this this reformation of the church was supposed to be that a lot of other uh, princes and other important people signed on to it as well. And so it really did come to represent Protestants throughout, it's sort of a united front calling for a reformation according to what Luther had said. Um, the, um, the emperor does not accept this. He does not think it's a good idea. He insists that the people who had signed it renounce their signatures on it. They refuse. The emperor is really mad. <laughs> the Protestant princes at this point, and it was mostly princes that had signed this thing, they knew that no one of them had sufficient power that if Charles V came after them, they couldn't stand up to him. And he's preparing for war. So all of these Protestant princes get together, and they form a what's called the League of Schmaltal, Schmal Calden. And it's all of the Protestant princes who say, we're all going to fight together if Charles V comes after us. Both sides are getting ready for war, and they know it's going to be a long, mean-spirited war. And once again, international events keep Charles V from pursuing this. Francis of France, Charles' old nemesis, decides that he... Um, does, is not being respected enough, so he threatens to go to war again against Charles, and the Turks attack again. I know that Charles V must keep saying, oh man, <laughs> again from Francis, and again from Suleiman. Okay, so Charles must, try, must make an effort to try to get all of the German princes agreeing, supporting him, not, not getting ready to fight him, but getting ready to support him, 
Because whether Francis attacks first or, or the Turks, either way, he's got to have the biggest army he can to fight. And so he says, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need you guys on my side, and so therefore, let's negotiate this thing. And they come to an agreement that, and this is in Nuremberg in 1532, that Protestants will be allowed to practice their faith as long as they agree not to expand outside the territories where they already are. Charles V has to make this concession in order to have the support he needs in order to fight one of two wars, whichever one happens first, either against France or against the Turks. So Protestants, all the Protestant princes, are allowed to practice within their particular area of control to practice Lutheranism or Protestantism, you know, the, the Reformed version of the faith, as they want. The condition is they can't spread outside that. So they pursue, they, they follow up with the Augsburg Confession as the statement of faith in the Protestant states of Germany, but the thing is that people being people, even though the princes didn't officially expand beyond their, their places, people traveling did. And so the Protestant faith continues to spread. Even though the princes don't formally do it, it happens informally. Protestantism begins to take over much more, Lutheranism, much more of Germany than it had at the point at which the Nuremberg truce and the negotiations does allow Protestantism. Okay? Questions about that? Yes, John? Um, where in that timeline, and if you could make some comments about um, the uh, table talks, where, 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 did, where were they part of that? And well, the table talks were, were uh, that was Luther's um, presentation of what his family life was about. And that and became sort of his theology, of, it was during that time period, and there's sort of informal things that he was writing and people started gathering and putting them together. But that included uh, some of his work with regard to his family, that's how that became a model for them. Um, the timetable on that, I'm looking for a couple of dates here. I confess I don't have all of those dates. Um, well, let me tell you, the small church I mentioned, that, and Luther rejoiced in being part of it, I quote here, uh, out of those experiences and out of the life of the family came the famous table talks that his students compiled and published and which are one of the best uh, avenues of insight for him as a man. Now that would have happened, uh, oh, I'm looking for a date. I think, my guess is that that would happen in the uh, early Earlier 1520s. Before all the conflict. Well, no, I think it'd be after the conflict because it, the conflict, a lot of the conflict happened before Luther came back to Wittenberg and when he started releasing the nuns. Okay, it was when he started helping nuns and monks leave monasteries. That was when he ended up getting married and had a family, and it was from his family that he then started writing the table talks. So it would have been in the 1520s probably. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but. Just knowing some of the other events around it. That's an interesting reading. If anybody would like to yeah. read about that table talk, yeah. it's just short, short and very informal. I mean, they're not. It's not huge theological stuff. It's no. very valuable, very worth reading. So, yes, Mary. Uh, going back to that uh, list there, whatever happened to uh, John Tetzel? He seems to fade fades away. You know, I don't know. I do not know. I mean, he. He still would have had the support for a long time after that. It was a long time after that before Luther uh, gained any, any authority, any power, you know. And so, but I don't know. It'd be interesting to look that up. I don't know what happened. Yeah. It'd be interesting to find out. He was not a nice man. I mean, the guy lied. He, just, and he lied about things about Jesus in order to try to make money. Okay? That's pretty bad stuff. Um, hopefully he repented. I don't know. Um, I want to talk for just a few minutes then about Luther's theology, a couple of major points. It's important to note that Luther developed most of his theological premises, the things, the major principles of his Lutheran theology, he developed very early on, before the Diet of Worms in 1521, for instance. I, I took this to the Diet of Worms. But fairly early on, between 1517 and 1521, several years in there, Luther created, established most of his theological points, and then the rest of his life, what he would do is expand on them, you know, or you know, talk more about the same principles, but those pretty much remain the same. One of the first theological principles, um, in the, and I, all of this is in addition to the idea of justification by faith. Okay, that was his big one, that you don't earn justification, that God grants you justification as an act of mercy. This is why Luther maintained predestination, as did Calvin and every other significant theologian in the Protestant church. Pretty much up until you know fairly more, much more recent times, the idea is that 
Righteousness is entirely a gift of God. It is a mercy He gives us. It is nothing we do. Well, if you really believe it's nothing we do, then it's all from God, and God gives it freely to whom He chooses. That's kind of the definition of predestination. It's all an act of God. Okay? I'm not going to carry that further because I know half of you just <laughs> disagree with me. Uh, but you need to know Luther and Calvin and most of the other major theologians of the Protestant faith have said that predestination and therefore complete grace, complete grace, not even our ability to decide, but complete act of God in, in giving righteousness and justification. That, you know, that was the fundamental plank that got Luther started, as we talked about. Now, in addition to that, he had a major theology of the Word of God. And his emphasis on the Word of God was that that is the starting point and the final authority for all theology, including his. When Luther said the Word of God, however, he wasn't, what I'm about to say, Luther considered the Bible as, as tremendously important. It was the place where he got the understanding yet. But when he talked about the Word of God, <coughs> he meant much more than just the written words in the Bible. To Luther's mind, the Word of God the, is the gospel, the good news, which is Christ Jesus. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word of God literally means God as manifest in Jesus Christ. Luther would say, when you read the Bible, if you don't find Jesus in your reading, then you're not reading the Word of God. Because Jesus, the Word of God incarnate, we find Him in the Bible, and so that's why the Bible is so important. But the words themselves on the printed page, unless we find Jesus there, I mean, if our mind is blinded, that's why, you know, people who are skeptics and liberals, some of them can read the Bible and go, ah, no. Because they are not finding Jesus there. For them, Luther would say, that's not the Word of God. It's simply written documents from long ago. It is when you find Jesus, the incarnate Word of God, in that Bible, that's the Word of God. But again, not to diminish the importance of the Bible itself, of the written Word. He said, as had John Huss before him, that a lay Christian with the authority of the Word of God in Scripture, in the Bible, has more authority than any pope or any council. So he advocated the authority of the written Word of God, the Bible, but because of what's in it, and that is that that's where we find Jesus. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, a second major theology that Luther advocated, and again, I, I say that word of God, he wrote a lot about that. There are huge amounts of material he wrote, but what I'm giving you is just sort of a statement about what that doctrine was. And, and recognizing that the Catholic Church would have said, well, the word of God, the Bible, is equal to but not greater than um, the authority of the church, that the magisterium of the church. This is one of the two or three biggest theological differences between Catholicism and Protestantism today is the Protestant faith, starting with Luther, would say the authority of the Word of God is here and the church, while it's important, is down here. The Catholic Church says the authority of the Word of God, written, the Bible, and the authority of the magisterium is equal. That's why when Protestants say, where do they get this doctrine about Mary being immaculately conceived, meaning born without sin? That's not the Bible. Well, the Catholic Church says, no, that's a revelation that God gave to the Catholic, Catholic Church, the magisterium, the leaders of the church, and that's equal to the Bible. So you're not going to win that argument because there, there's a reference to different authority. Okay, Marvin? Is there ever a conflict between the church and the Bible? Well, they would say, they would say no because... Um, they're covering things that the Bible doesn't necessarily... Exactly. Matter. They would say, well, there's, there's stuff outside the Bible. Yeah. You know. Um, anyway. We would say that some of the doctors disagree with what the Bible says, but that comes with, like the fact that Jesus, or Mary was ever virgin. She never had children. And we go, excuse me, but his brother's names, and you know, there, and his sisters were there too, and, and they go, oh, well, that means cousin. Well, no, actually it doesn't. The word is brother and sister. Well, and unless family by a previous wife who's passed on... He's taking Mary under his wing. And Except Jesus was supposed to have been the oldest of the group. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. wherever that takes us. So, um, a second the theological point of Luther is the theology of the cross. Luther said that most Christians wanted to focus on what he called a theology of glory. 
The theology of glory uh, looks to find in God all the things that we think are important and praiseworthy. In other words, we look at God and we want to focus on the power of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God. Luther said, in effect, this theology of glory that most people have, we're trying to make God into a bigger version of us. <laughs> and what we think is glorious. When in fact, God is completely outside us. He's completely different than us. And where we ought to look for the reality of who God is and what God is, is not in our ideas of what's cool, but rather to look to the cross. Because it was on the cross, in the sacrifice that Jesus made, that the true nature of God is revealed. So not a theology of glory, but a theology of the cross is where we find the true nature of God. And he developed that theme greatly after that. And he believed that the theology of the cross was a huge stumbling block because it meant us recognizing that our God is not, is not what the church, the Catholic Church had represented in, in manifest glory and gold and urban stoles and you know, golden altars and all that. All of that was just a reflection of what we think is cool. That's not who God is. You want to know who God is? Look at the cross. So the theology of the cross instead of a theology of glory, which he felt humanity, especially the church before him, had tended to focus on. Okay? A third one um, is a theology of the relationship between law and gospel. Now, um, Luther maintained that the revelation of God is manifest in two ways, in law and in gospel. Now, he did not mean by that Old Testament law and New Testament gospel. Much more what he meant is the thing that I said earlier, is that... Um, there is a, an earthly, well, I'll get to the two kingdoms in a minute. Uh, he, he talked about the fact that law and gospel exists in every one of us. The gospel part is the fact that I'm saved, that I am made righteous. I, righteousness is given to me by an act of God. But I'm still a sinner underneath that. I'm still broken. I'm still going to make mistakes. I'm still going to fall short. That's the law part, the part of me that is still broken, that still struggles, that still looks for some kind of redemption, even though I've been saved. So he looked at humanity and said that when every, within every person is manifest, the old spirit, the old nature that is still broken and still sins, that is the law part, and the new nature, which is the gospel part, which is the good news, the justification that God has given us. And those two things come together. He believed that there's an uh, indissoluble bond between gospel and law, and that each of us reflected that in our own Christian life because we were both sinners, and justified believers. And so that gospel and law is kind of his explanation for how we can be saved completely by the grace of God and yet still mess up okay, because of those two natures. He also had a theology of church and sacrament. Now, Luther, um, Luther was not a rationalist, which he's been... It's almost as though because of the influence Luther had, everybody wants to try to claim him as their own. Rationalists want to say he was a rationalist. Individualists want to say he was an individualist. Humanists want to say he's a humanist. He doesn't really fit into those categories. In fact, he spoke ad, you know, very adamantly against reason as being the authority, because a lot of the, a lot of the rationalist Renaissance kinds of folks believe that. He actually referred to reason sometimes as a whore. So that's not a positive thing. Um, and yet he believed that the church and the sacraments of the church, while that didn't save you, that was still very important. He believed that we are saved by, again, the righteousness that is, that is given to us by God, but then the living out of that righteousness needed to occur in the context of the community, which was represented most purely by the church and the sacraments. Now, by the church, he didn't mean necessarily, again, remember, he didn't want to stop being a Catholic. They made it. Not necessarily the Pope and the Magisterium and the, and the Catholic Church. He meant the body of true believers down through history. Those who were truly believers in Jesus Christ. That the church and the sacraments, and he believed in only two sacraments because he believed the only sacraments were the ones that Jesus himself practiced and modeled for us, which are baptism and communion. The other five sacraments of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has seven, he rejected as being not something that Jesus told us to do or that he modeled for us. So those two sacraments and the living experience of the community of the church are critical. That doesn't save us, but that's how we live out our lives as saved people. Okay, That community was critically important. And everybody was a minister 
in that church. We all had some responsibilities of being Christians to live out our faith in a way that showed us as ministers of that gospel. And then I mentioned before the two kingdoms, the idea that there was um, a kingdom of the church and a kingdom of the state. And Luther maintained that both of those were ordained by God. People who had political authority, now they could be disobedient, they could be bad rulers, but they were put in positions of authority by God. Paul says that. Paul says, you know, pray for the people who are in authority over you because they're there because God let them be. Now again, they then can cho choose with their princes or kings. They can either be good princes and kings or bad princes and kings. Luther said the purpose of the state and the leaders in the state that God has anointed and put in place was to maintain order, to prevent crime, to control our sinfulness in a very secular, practical kind of way. The responsibility of the church, which is the other kingdom, was our spiritual well-being, to focus on the things of God, the teaching, and to the evangelism and ministry. Both were necessary. The, re the time you got in trouble was when you try to mingle the two. When the secular state, who's supposed to be responsible for maintaining order, started to try to tell people spiritually what they should do, or when the spiritual realm decided they wanted to have secular authority and control things politically. So he maintained that there are two kingdoms, both ordained by God. Of the two, the spiritual is more important, the church is more important, he believed. But both are necessary and ordained by God. And again, Paul talks about that. Um, those are some of the theologies that he particularly manifested. Um, and we're going to get a lot more into down the road as we talk about the history after this. But this gives you an idea who Luther was, where he was coming from, what happened around him, and you know what sort of what his theologies were. Questions? In the last couple of minutes, yes. Okay, uh, this is going back a little bit, but when was um, celibacy uh, ordained? Or uh, I'm going to have trouble giving you a date. Instituted. It was quite late that it was mandated. mandated. Um, I think like the 13th or 14th century. But it was an issue for a long time. And the reason why celibacy was an issue is this whole idea of... Uh, of people having clerical positions, you know, as a, as a priest or as a bishop especially. Um, the idea was that a lot of the motivation for people wanting to have that kind of power and that kind of money and those kind of positions was so they could pass it on to their kids. All right? If I'm, if I'm, I want to get rich so that I can give it to my kids when I die. And a good way to get rich is to become a bishop. Well, part of what the church was trying to do was to say, let's take that temptation away by saying, you can't have kids. And the way, how do you do that? Well, to say you have to be celibate. Part of that was an effort to try to keep from falling into some of the immoral practices that the church was responsible for. There really wasn't so much a theological reason for it as there was a practical reason. They were trying to stop some of the immoral kinds of things that were going on, especially simony, buying, yes. buying religious positions, etc. Okay? Uh, the other question is, when did Latin become Italian? When did Latin as a, as a, you need as to a ask, communication? Yeah, you need to ask a linguist. Uh, I mean, I can tell you when Latin was with regard to the church. I mean, yes, Latin changed, yes. but, but, with, but because Latin was, the, this is not a church issue. No. Latin was the language of the Romans. Yes. And as Rome, you know, uh, as, as Rome controlled everything, as it evolved, languages evolved. And so it evolved from Latin into a number of Romance languages, not just Italian but also French and Spanish. All of these languages, you know, are descendants of Latin. When that happened, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not really a linguist. Does anybody know? I guess we can find out. But, yeah, that, that's really a linguist question. Anything else? Okay, now you know everything you need to know about Luther. Luther. <laughs> wow. Next week, we will pick up with other reformers. Ulvik Spingley, who you may never have heard of, but actually probably was before Luther. Uh, Calvin, my guy, and, and uh, the <laughs> okay? God bless you guys this week.